Good morning, everyone. I'm Lourdes Terecha, founder of the Rise of Privacy Tech. Thank you for joining us today. We are kicking this off with the first panel on fundraising and investing in the privacy tech landscape. And we are just going to go through the outline of the panel quickly. We'll start off with introductions and we'll go into an overview of the privacy tech landscape, talk about what's investable, talk about the key indicators of the rise of privacy tech and end with some advice for founders and investors who are looking to join and invest in, in the privacy tech landscape. And so without further ado, let me ask each of the panelists to introduce themselves, starting with Mary. Hi, great to be here and thank you for having me. Um, my name is Mary Ginoprio. I'm a vice president at Bessemer Venture Partners, which I joined two years ago to start the firm's growth investing practice. Since then, have made investments across software, but relevant to the data privacy stack, uh, we led the Series C into Big ID, a New York-based data scanning and inventory company. Um, let's go next to Jesus. Hi, everyone. Good morning. My name is Jesus Salas. I'm an associate with Omidyar Network, which is a venture philanthropy group founded and backed by Pam and Pierre Omidyar. We invest early stage capital in founders building companies that recognize the transformational power of technology and therefore prioritize trust, transparency, fairness, and individual empowerment. We're interested in solutions that reduce misinformation and bias, improve individual data ownership and control, as well as ensure identity protection. And because we're focused on investing in the next generation of technologies and business models that embody trust and transparency, we view privacy preserving products and services as well as business models to be essential. Jason, you're up next. Great. Um, great to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm the co-founder and CEO at Privatar. Uh, we're a software company that provides a platform to organizations that enables them to effectively manage sensitive data for analytics and machine learning, and to do that with comprehensive privacy controls. Uh, we have customers across industry verticals and geographies as you know, we see this as a very horizontal challenge for all data driven companies. Um, our platform enables the application and management of advanced privacy enhancing technologies to open up sensitive data for practical use. And um, we've raised over $150 million now from great investors. Uh, Wahlberg Pincus recently led our Series C, Axel, uh, our Series B and, and Partech. Uh, our Series A in 2017. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. And certainly not the least, Ben. Hey, good morning, everyone. Uh, so I'm Ben Brook, co-founder and CEO of Transcend. Um, we built Transcend because users can't exercise their data rights today, even though it's their legal right. Um, and you can go to any major company's privacy policy and see that for yourself. Um, so we've, we've actually made a breakthrough in technology that enables any company to give their users data rights very easily. Um, it fixes a lot of the broken internal processes um, that are resulting in non-compliance today um, and ultimately is improving the end user experience for exercising data rights. Um, and if we're successful in doing what, we, we're, uh, what we're setting out to do, um, it's going to actually enable everybody to be able to exercise their data rights um, and have that preference um, executed within seconds. Um, so uh, it's totally auto automated on the back end there. Um, yeah. Glad to be here. Thank you, Ben, and we're glad to have you. Uh, I think we start off. Well, we start off with an overview of the privacy tech landscape, and given its nascency, there's been quite some debate on what is included or should be included in 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 this landscape. I mean, it might be a bit simplistic, but my own take of it is, you know, tech solutions that solve for a privacy problem, they are what's in scope in this broad landscape. So regardless of whether they're B2B or B2C, um, if you're trying to solve for privacy problems, not just security, and yes, there is that distinction between privacy and security, the cybersecurity landscape has been uh, mature and in development and on the rise for I think at least 15 years. Uh, we're just getting there in the privacy tech landscape. Uh, but uh, I think it's an exciting nascent field that is rife with opportunities. We see the B2B market starting to mature. Um, we, we see some exciting uh, tools and products in, in, the, in the compliance space, in the B2B space, but we also see some exciting privacy engineering tools for developers and data scientists. 
but without further ado, let me let me kick it off with uh, with Mary and and ask her how how do you and and Bessemer uh, venture partners in particular look at and define the privacy tech landscape from your from your lens and your thesis? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, at Bessemer, we have a thesis that privacy debt is the new technical debt, and the combination of a proliferation of data, companies' inability to understand where that data is stored, let alone how to protect it and a changing regulatory landscape leads to a material investable segment and opportunity that is privacy tech. And it represents itself the intersection of cybersecurity, big data and analytics, legal and compliance, and then addresses the requirements to collect, safely store, and ethically use data, um, which is obviously good for investors, for companies, and good for consumers. Um, at Bessemer, we have tried to scope the data privacy stack in a thesis piece that we published recently and we have a few different categories that we think is in are encompassed by the bright, broader privacy tech landscape. Uh, data scanning and inventory, so before a company can protect its sensitive data, needs to understand where that data is and, and how to inventory it. Uh, data cataloging and governance, once it has identified that sensitive data, control access and apply rules. Workflow productivity, uh, responding to DSARs and other regulatory inquiries. Uh, consent management, um, once you've identified and located data, ensuring it has consent to use it. Uh, data de-identification, ensuring that private private data stays private. And then consumer privacy tools, which are um, how consumers can uh, protect themselves and their data. And together, we think that privacy tech represents companies' ability, attempts to identify, secure, and then ultimately use their data in a manageable and ethical way. Um, so that's uh, a little bit of a summary of the, the Bessemer perspective on it. Thank you, Mary. He says, I want to I want to shoot this back at you, given Amidyar's early stage work in, in this space. Yeah, certainly. Uh, so to start off, we all know we live in a world where tech companies generally aspire to collect as much data as possible. And so we, we at Omidyar Network feel that there's a need for proper checks and balances combined with technology that is built responsibly. Now, some of the stewardship principles for what we mean by responsible technology include supporting equity, showing integrity, sustaining innovation, and respecting freedoms. And we see privacy tech as a way to respect freedoms and thus as a category of responsible technology. And more specifically, we see the privacy tech landscape as covering a few different areas. One is encryption technology. Another is responsible biometrics and identity protection. A third is data management and compliance. And then a fourth one includes privacy enhancing technology, of which there are many. One example would be differential privacy. And privacy tech is exciting because it has really started to materialize in the, with different solutions in the past couple of years. A couple of examples of, the, of these, one again is differential privacy, which really reduces challenges with recommendations and data sharing. And another more common one was encryption, which ensures sensitive data stays protected while remaining functional. And the interesting piece is uh, with this in terms of trying to commercialize these technologies is the different avenues a business could take, whether that's B2B, B2C, B2G, and so on. And so we see lots of opportunity to ensure technology is really working better for the individual while still ensuring its functionality and convenience to the end user. Thank you, Jesus. Jason and Ben, given you've done quite a bit of market research when starting up your, your respective startups, can, do you have anything to add as to how Mary and Jesus have defined the privacy tech landscape that you think is important? So uh, I'll go first. I think um, you know, at the very highest level, I, I really like Jesus' uh, uh, definition there about how privacy is about protecting freedoms. I think privacy is actually a very broad topic and um, very broad definition and um, in some instances we want absolute privacy and data in those cases needs to exist in a completely private state so we talked about encryption end-to-end -end encrypted messages for example there's no way to access the data on those streams and this is very necessary in certain situations for example journalists communicating in oppressive regimes um, another example might be private browsing with a with a vpn Again, you know, necessary in certain circumstances, necessarily, but necessarily ensuring that no data can be analyzed or used to make predictions in those contexts. So I think that's one way to look at privacy. And I think that type of privacy is very important in the context of a free and democratic society. When we start to look at data, and, and Mary really alluded to this, 
perhaps more normal is that, you know, with all the data being generated and collected with respect to individuals, um, we need to acknowledge that individuals have a right over that data. Um, so do other groups. So, you know, data is all about rights. I have a right over my data, but perhaps arguably society has a right over some of the data that I generate as well. So my medical record, for example, could be really useful in the context of medical research or curing diseases or combating COVID. And so we need to acknowledge that there's this, this is complex uh, rights matrix. And if we want to be able to effectively use those data sets, you know, while respecting the data subject, how do we enable that data to be used while effectively protecting it? And I think a, a large part of the privacy tech landscape is focused on that problem, leveraging privacy enhancing techniques like differential privacy to make data available in that context. Um, another good way to structure it, I think, and I'll just touch on this briefly, is the National Institute of uh, Standards and Technology in the US have published a great controls framework for data privacy technology. And really that lays out a very comprehensive picture from identifying data to governing processes to controlling and communicating and protecting data. So really that full gamut. And when looking at vendors or evaluating opportunities in the space, I think it's worthwhile understanding you know, what the intersection is with that controls framework. Yeah, I, I, would, I would also agree. And just to add on that, there, there are some really exciting new technologies that may be able to get the best, best of both worlds. So um, encryption doesn't actually have to be pitted against analytics all the time. So we're moving uh, forward on things like homomorphic encryption, which will allow us to actually perform analytics and calculations and studies um, with actually encrypted data. Um, so it's it's sort of like the the ultimate version of like what the differential privacy uh, offers now. Um, but yeah, I, I would also just add that in my opinion, privacy tech is, has really historically been providing tooling to uh, legal and privacy offices. Uh, but but these modern privacy laws are, are unique in that they demand so many things around data flows. And uh, that means that like it's product and engineering teams who are building privacy features, altering their products, redesigning their systems. And they're feeling the brunt of, of a lot of the force from GDPR, CCPA and, and other new modern privacy laws. And so I, th I think the new guard of privacy companies are, are going to be poor engineers and, and are and importantly, will also be built by engineers. Um, so it, it's 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 going to be um, there's going to be a, a wave there as well. I, I believe. Um, I think it's also important for us to understand that um, while most privacy tech uh, tech companies today are are B two B and they're they're helping businesses comply with new regulations, um, these new technologies are also going to have the largest impact on how consumer privacy works. Um, so whether users truly get better privacy uh, is entirely going to depend on how we as the B2B startups, how easy we make it for these businesses to offer more transparency and offer more control to their users. Um, and, and yeah, so the, the, it, it's, it's a really exciting landscape now and, and I, I, it's, it's incredible what the impact is going to be over the next 10 years. So. Thanks, Ben. I, I like the last point that you made about how, you know, enabling these B2B businesses to provide, get a hold of their privacy practices and, and provide uh, better privacy controls to consumers. So how, how that would affect um, indirectly or directly the consumer privacy in, in the end. So, so that's something uh, that, that I saw myself writing down. And, and so thank you for sharing that. Now that we've gone ahead and you know defined in our perspective what this nascent field looks like to us. I want to start, I want to ask the investors, starting with Jesus, as to what what they believe is investable at this stage in, in, in the privacy tech landscape. And, and yes, I, I do understand that things change, the market changes. But at this point in time, um, I, I'm sure our audience would love to hear, what do you think is investable right now? Yeah, so I'll answer it in two parts. First, there's some early impressions that we've gathered and then more around what our, our view and thesis is. So first, early impressions. We've seen a significant amount of innovation happening in a couple of different areas, which I'll touch on briefly. One is a number of companies wanting to be an intermediary for users or function as a data exchange. We're excited about how much control some of these models offer users and the premise that it holds if and when we see mass market adoption. 
another innovation we've been seeing is a pivot with which uh, some of our speakers have mentioned away from a consumer driven market to a more enterprise adoption one. A driver of this could be that regulation in many parts of the world is now putting the onus for compliance on enterprises and thus businesses are now starting to see that privacy and security can be a differentiating mechanism. Another area of innovation that we've uh, seen is given the changing regulatory landscape and environment, data management and compliance has seen um, uh, and become very relevant in recent years. And we expect that trend to continue. And then lastly, identity protection has seen a significant amount of traction, particularly in the FinTech and KYC space. Um, at Omidyar Network, we've been focusing on digital identity for a number of years and through our portfolio have learned just how important it is for governments and enterprises to collaborate for an optimal solution. And so we remain excited by what's to come in the identity verification and protection space. Now, moving a little bit more towards our thesis and perspective, we understand it's difficult to stop large scale data collection in a world where companies see data as a moat and where us as users were overwhelmed with technology like sensors that are trying to capture and convert all of our living experiences into digital data. Thus, we think critically about how data is captured, processed, and then stored. And so when these process can processes can happen in a more secure and private way, we see it as a win-win. Um, and it's what makes us excited, excited about privacy tech. Thanks for that, Jesus. Mary, I, I, obviously, I'm, I'm always curious what you think about, about this. Yeah, Jesus hit on a lot of the key themes that I think we've seen as well. Um, I just have a couple more um, things to add. Um, first of all, the great thing about privacy, the privacy stack, is that it differs from a lot of other nascent categories that have a tough time getting budget. Um, but the regulatory tailwinds made that budget immediate and available. And so insofar as it becomes investable, um, fortunately, you can see there being enough budget to support large TANs and therefore large companies. And, and that's obviously incredibly important for me as an investor. Um, speaking specifically to the places where Bessemer spending time, um, one of the segments of the, the privacy tech landscape where we're spending a lot of time is data lineage, um, which is kind of a missing gap in data governance. Uh, data catalog products providing high level visibility into an organization's data sets, but poor visibility into the journey that data takes between them. And obviously, as so many other of these categories of uh, the privacy tech landscape have matured, it's also presented uh, tangential uh, problems that are, are ripe for companies to be created in and then invested behind. And I think the, the data lineage, um, uh, the data lineage opportunity is material in a place where we're spending a lot of time right now. Thank you, Mary. I want us to take some time to talk about the why now for privacy tech. And, and in my opinion, I, I've seen three key indicators. The first one has been the increasing number of, of privacy regulations all over the world that require companies to take privacy seriously, but also to design their tools with privacy in mind. The second one is the increasing number of, of amount of funding going to privacy companies, even in the midst of the pandemic. You know, we, we saw Ben announce a couple of weeks ago and, and, and Jason, I know that you closed the round before COVID, but, but we also saw you guys made that, make that announcement a month ago. Um, and then lastly is consumer privacy sentiment in favor for privacy. We've, we've seen a lot of research um, just on top of my head with peer research saying that Americans, more than half of Americans are, are rejecting online services because of privacy concerns. And even during the pandemic, 70% of Americans are, are refusing to use contact tracing apps, even, even, even though we have a, a legitimate reason to do so, right? For, for, for public health reasons. Um, so, so those are some of the, the, key indicators that I've been seeing. I'd love to hear what um, you guys are seeing on your end, starting off with the founders. Ben, what have you learned from, from your own market research? Why, why now? Yeah, I mean, uh, ju like just to follow on to that contact tracing thing, um, people, people don't really trust technology anymore. I, I think the narrative around Silicon Valley has been in a spiral since Cambridge Analytica. 
and um, and that that's a perfect example of it. Is is everybody thinks yeah, there's a great benefit to it, but what else is happening? And until we get over that hurdle and rebuild trust with users, these types of technologies just won't be viable. And so we do need to break down some some barriers here and actually improve consumer privacy before we can have these types of technologies be implemented with the trust of consumers. Um, and, and, and yeah, I mean, I, personally, I saw firsthand just how frustrating and impossible it is to actually access personal information about myself and exercise my own data rights. I've, I've personally, I mean, as, as a data rights company founder, I've re requested my data from hundreds of companies and it is always an arduous process with disappointing results. Uh, right now, you know, exercising your basic data rights can feel like going to the DMV. You're on this, the phone with support for hours, and 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 frankly, it it, it usually just results in, in something that's not actually the full picture. Um, and so, you know, increasingly, companies have be, uh, behavioral data that's telling your entire life story, and as a user, you don't have a way to read it. And so, uh, today, data rights just are, are still unmet by companies. So what's encoded in the law and what consumers demand, um, there's still a massive gap between that and what's actually technically possible for companies. Um, and yeah, so so today, you know, data rights inside companies is, is, is pretty much universally viewed as one big mess. And um, that, that's fundamentally because of, there's a core infrastructure problem where Data is spread across many, many different systems and vendors and tools, and it's unstructured and it's hard to figure out how to operate on it and, or delete it without having downstream effects. And so there's a lot of technical problems that have to be addressed before you can even get to offering users like exercisable data rights. And um, and so that, that's that's why now for Transcend, um, we, 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 we break down those barriers and, and, and there are other companies that, and like private cars all doing that. So. We think that by solving that infrastructure problem, and um, some actually cultivate a reality in which you have their data rights. Thanks, Ben. Jason, what, what was Pervitor's own why now? Um, I, and I don't mean to focus you on to that specifically. Uh, you're, you're also free to share as to why you think the, the broader privacy tech landscape is on the rise in, in your own opinion. No, I mean, I think it's a great question. I think, um, you know, for us, the the, the big change, or, or what I was um, sort of became cognizant of back in 2015, was really the availability of data. And um, you know, that was the big change. We'd we'd had the algorithms to process data, and we had the reduced cost of compute, but suddenly we had, you know, big data essentially, and largely due to the you know the, the sensors that we all carry around with us in our pockets every day, and um, this incredible digital exhaust. Um, that we that we you know that we create increasingly now you know as in our lives uh, post COVID everything's become so much more digital and so we're creating all this data this behavioral data that that Ben talked about our lives are on the grid and that data data is suddenly available and it's bringing the the promise of advanced analytics and machine learning to life and um, because that data is so powerful so revealing. And so for me, the question was, how do we use that data? Because clearly there's value to individuals and to companies and to society. Um, how do we use the data without the, the, the sort of infringements of the past, right? The, the turning people into products, the, 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 that sort of massive breach of trust um, that we're still suffering from now and um, from the abuse of those data sets by, by Silicon Valley companies. Um, so, you know, how do we do that? And what I realized is that there is this great family of technologies that have been, you know, developed and, and worked on through our academic community for over a decade um, that was designed to enable us to extract signal from data, value from data without infringing on, on those individual privacy you know, constraints. And, and so privacy enhancing technologies um, bringing those to organizations processing data, enabling them to deploy these technologies and to do so at scale um, allows them to then follow those privacy by design principles, transparency, minimization, controllability. The goal, obviously, as you alluded to earlier, is to bring back trust because unless we have trust from the data consumer, you know, it really brings a huge amount of friction in, into the data ecosystem. So 
Um, you know, so that that was one big trend. And then I think, you know, certainly over the past five years, we've seen a massive shift. Um, ben talked about Cambridge Analytica, and that was the first major privacy breach. It was very public, and 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 you know, everyone was aware of that. So it really raised the awareness of privacy as a topic. We've had the regulatory regime come in behind, which was also been fantastic. If you didn't know what privacy was. Um, post GDPR, you know, everyone's certainly aware of the the term and the word. And, uh, you know, even in the United States, it's become a, a, an accepted and understood uh, set of concepts. So that's been enormously helpful. I actually think some companies have done a really good job of of harnessing that as a, as a competitive advantage already. Apple's a great example where, you know, they've really recognized that it plays well to their business model. And they've led with this message that your data stays on your phone. And, you know, I think they've really turned that to to a huge advantage. Um, for other companies, I think there is a, an opportunity to make uh, that trustworthy computing a core differentiator for, for their products and services and, and, and make them a key and intrinsic part of the products that they offer to their customers. Um, so that, that was really the, you know, what led us to start Privatar back in 2015. Um, and it's been, you know, it's been a great ride since then. And I, I think we're, we're just getting started in many ways. Thank you for sharing that, Jason. I, I particularly love two points that you made. One was, you know, treating data as value. I think it's a misconception that privacy folks are all about not using the data or not collecting data at all. And that couldn't be farther from the truth. There are many of us who are for tapping data and its value. And in order to do that, we believe that having good privacy practices in place is what's going to get us there to tap to tap into the value of data and 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 start treating it as as an asset versus a liability or a compliance hurdle um, i also like your point on trust and competitive advantage and yes we've seen a lot of companies in the btc space do that like apple and microsoft and, and we were seeing a lot of, of folks in the b2b space as well do that especially in the cybersecurity industry where uh, deals are 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 held back um, at the end of the quarter, and, and these are multi-million dollar deals uh, because of privacy and security practices in the agreements. I, 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 you know, the folks in the audience know how this feels because we we've been in those deals um, negotiating them. So thank you for that. I, I do want to let the investors. Um, take a stab at this as well. And so Mary, starting with you, why do you think there is, you know, you know what's your own personal take and, and, and certainly investors take as to uh, why the rise of privacy tech now? I think that Ben and, and Jason really hit on um, the trends that we've seen. Um, simplifying it, I think it's a combination of data proliferation, massive consumer data scandals, and then uh, widespread privacy regulation like GDPR and CCPA, all providing tailwind to the space and uh, provides a really clear why now to um, why these companies are being founded, the problems they're trying to solve, and then uh, most relevant to me, why um, I think why, why now I'm going to invest in them. Thank you, Mary. And, and hey, Suze? Do you have anything to add to that one? Yeah, I'll be brief. Uh, a lot of the points were already mentioned earlier, but just to highlight, we started looking at the identity, digital identity space four years ago. And one of the key learnings from this work was the importance of data privacy and security. And we believe that these are relevant topics for technologists, businesses, and governments. Um, so that said, we're really excited to see the topic of privacy now work its way into the zeitgeist, particularly in the context of some of the points that were mentioned with the regulatory tailwinds, GDPR and CCPA, the rise of data breaches, and the huge costs they have on businesses via cybercrime and or theft. And then lastly, more, and more pertinent in recent is COVID-19 and having the shelter in place and being Zoom bombed, and hopefully we're not often bombed right now, uh, but then also contact tracing apps and how that heavily depends on surveillance in one way or another. A yeah, good point about the pandemic playing a role in it as well. So thank you for that, Jesus. I want us to spend some time, um, given we have a bunch of founders in the in the audience. Um, they're keen to seek advice from you guys. We'll start off with with uh, Ben and Jason. Um, maybe you can share with us what you've learned in your last round of fundraising um, with those who are coming up after you. I'm happy to start, Jason. So um, 
Uh, yeah, so I, just to provide a bit of background on our recent fundraise, so we, we just announced uh, our $25 million Series A uh, from Index and Excel. Um, and so I, I can go a little bit into what that looked like and, and kind of like how we started up and what our early stage looked like uh, leading up to it, because I think that's ultimately the most important part. Um, so as I said earlier, we see this as like a core infrastructure problem. Uh, there's fundamentally just technical barriers that need to be addressed. And so we actually, uh, we had a pretty different approach as a company. Um, our entire approach to the space was just to deeply solve this problem up front first and, and build that necessary infrastructure to offer data rights totally automatically. So we had like a very high bar of like first principles that like we needed our infrastructure to do. And so, uh, and our criteria for like a proof of value was that it would be adopted by the top engineering teams uh, in the world. So like we wanted to make sure that there were some companies that we really respect as engineers and we know their engineers are uh, widely respected and make good choices. And if they can use Transcend, then uh, then that's our proof of value. So we actually went head, heads down for about two years uh, with a great engineering team uh, and, and just sort of building this, uh, working with a few pilots um, and then we took this and we presented it to companies like uh, Robinhood and Patreon and Open Door, um, and and we we were able to actually factor out a lot of the privacy engineering that they were doing. And today we now power the data rights processes for them. And so we had live examples where uh, you could point to uh, like our customers, and if you submit DSRs to them, they respond automatically and almost instantaneously. And so that was that was just like the proof point for us that going into fundraising showed that like we have actually solved this problem, um, and that was that was like our entire sort of criteria for fundraising. Um, so so we we crossed that hurdle and then we're able to do that. Um, the only other thing I would add is like advice. So I, I I think having live proof points is obviously incredibly important, and 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 because this is such a, a technical problem, like showing that you have customer love from engineers is super important as well as the privacy uh, privacy office and, and privacy lawyers. But I also think it's just really important to, to understand the space. Like privacy is incredibly esoteric. The laws are uh, the, the laws are complex and the, the, the regulatory environment is always evolving. So you have to have like full knowledge of that um, or come or otherwise come across it as tone deaf. So I think it's important for founders to really understand the laws and, and the technology as well. Um, and to just have deep sympathy for all the professionals in this space, whether they're privacy lawyers or engineers. Thank you, Ben. Great points about understanding your customers, the engineers, the, the lawyers, and the privacy folks uh, in the industry. I, I, that point's well taken. Uh, Jason? Um, hi. Um, sorry about that. So, yes, I think raising at each stage is, you know, has its own challenges and characteristics. Um, and, you know, the challenge that we faced over the years, certainly at the beginning, was privacy was just such an amorphous, ambiguous um, term that was not particularly well understood, uh, particularly um, on, on the US side of the Atlantic at that stage um, of the game. And, you know, it was often conflated with security. Um, there was a lot of confusion, people con conflating uh, security controls, uh, the, you know, preventing unauthorized access to systems with privacy controls, um, concerned more about you know restricting usage for authorized users and, and restricting purpose and managing lifecycle, and so on. And and there was a real confusion between those two terms. And um, we we tried to help that early by embracing phrases like privacy engineering, um, and safe data, which have become much more broadly adopted over the years. And um, the National Institute of Standards and Technology actually coined that term privacy engineering, but it's been a really useful uh, phrase to, to help organizations understand that there is this transition away from just managing the process of privacy compliance that Ben alluded to earlier with actual engineering practices and, and embedding you know, technology controls into applications and infrastructures to protect privacy. So I think there's been a huge uh, amount of progress uh, over the years in that sense. We also um, you know, tried to embark on a, on a great deal of thought leadership. Um, we created uh, white papers, we co-authored white papers with regulators and other industry bodies. 
um, which weren't product pitches, but, but more educational pieces to, to help bring the industry forward in terms of its understanding of, th of things like privacy enhancing technologies. Um, so that was a key piece. Um, we also uh, created an, an industry event, our In Confidence event, which was again about bringing the community together um, without selling, but really, you know, to drive broader education, um, explore key topics, you know, debate the issues around the, these topics to, to drive education and deeper understanding uh, in, in what is a really multidisciplinary commu uh, com community, because this is not just about technology. You know, we'll all, we'll all understand that as rapidly as the technology is evolving, so is the policy landscape. And the, the, we felt that the two nearly really needed to be uh, in sync in that respect. So that's been really helpful in, in our journey um, over the past few years. Um, you know, I guess in terms of, you know, actual fundraising, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, you know, I think there's some really good advice there in general. I would say as you progress through later stages, um, probably the most obvious thing is to develop relationships early. Um, and get to know your prospective investors well ahead of the time when you actually plan to fundraise. I think uh, you want to understand the dynamic and the culture of the investment company. They're going to join your 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 board and, and be a key member of your team um, if you do close around. And so starting that relationship really early, getting to know each other, makes the fundraising process you know much quicker and, and, and expedites the whole process when you actually come to fundraising. I'm sure the investors would agree with that last point that you have, but let me send it, you know, kick it off to them. Jesus. Yeah, I'll be brief. Um, I'd say be clear about your intentions and motivations and how you plan to execute on those. For us, it's just as much about the innovation and viability of the business as it is about the founders and their own dedication to ensuring privacy in their venture. So we're very much looking for founders who have given some deep thought to the positive and negative externalities of their products. And Mary. Yeah, um, since it is somewhat of a nascent category and not every investor candidly will be as familiar with it. Um, one thing that I've noticed the most successful um, companies do is a little bit of investor education candidly and being very, very clear on how they're planning on um, differentiating from competition because the, the, there are a good number of companies that have come to address a lot of the privacy tech concerns. The easiest way of doing so, as Ben alluded to, is actually having customers with whom pr prospective investors can speak to validate your technological differentiation. Um, but if you're early stage, just understanding the competitive landscape, where you differentiate and how you're going to win and being able to clearly articulate that is really key. Um, and the last piece of it that, that Jason also touched on is, you know, in, in this, in privacy tech, it, you're not only dealing with a technological moat, you're also dealing with a regulatory moat. And so understanding how policy and technology interplay and being able to, to um, internalize that and then, and then manifest that in your business is helpful as well. All great points. Thank you for sharing that, Mary. I, I think we have a couple minutes left to also dish out advice. We also have some investors who are interested in entering the privacy tech landscape. Um, I want to start, uh, start with Mary again and, and, and see what she can share from her own experience in, in privacy tech and um, you know, what new investors in the field might, might want to look out for or, or keep in mind. Um, I think, I think it kind of plays on to my last, uh, the, the, the answer I just gave to the last question. Um, there are a few things that investors need to be convinced of before they're going to invest in a new market. It tends to be that there's a large TAM, there's a clear answer to why now, and they're going to be able to pick the winner. And I think with, with privacy tech, there's a very clear TAM and a very clear why now, but I'm cutting through the competitive landscape, building relationships and um, understanding how one product will win over another is, is the hard part. Um, it's hard at the early stage, it's hard at the growth stage. Um, but for, for that, I suggest that um, any investor who's interested in, in investing in privacy tech, talk to other investors in the space, talk to founders who are trying to build businesses here, um, talk to end users who uh, need this kind of technology and, and understand where the main pain points are and, and map those to the companies that you're evaluating. Thank you, Mary. All, all good points. I, I think those are exactly the pain points that some of the investors have shared with us is just understanding it and figuring out who, who's the winner. Um, Jesus? 
Yeah, we're super excited to see more investors focus on this topic. And we really do believe that a new generation of responsible technology can arise, particularly in this moment of change. Our research to date tells us that this new generation of technology will come from changes at the regulatory, corporate, and capital allocation level. And so as investors, we can help influence change at the capital allocation level by focusing on investment opportunities in areas such as privacy tech. Oh, thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone who's been listening. And I also want to personally thank Jesus, Jason, and Mary, and, and, and Ben. Um, if you guys have any closing remarks, please feel free to share them with the audience. Crunch, Crunchbase announced that $10 billion was invested in the privacy and security, and security companies in 2019. So we're excited about the market, how it's responding. And if any like-minded founders or investors want to connect, feel free to reach out to us. Sure. Um... I'll just end by underscoring um, that the people here at this conference and, and in this room or on this stage uh, have a huge responsibility on their plates. Uh, we have to bring modern privacy into the world and, and really give users their data rights. Um, and, uh, and and yeah, whether that's through uh, the, the company that you're founding and building the technology to make it happen, or whether it's where you're putting your money as an investor, um, there, is, there is a great responsibility and, and ultimately these are human rights. Um, so, uh, yeah, I was saying on that. Thanks, Ben. Sorry about uh, that. Go ahead. Yeah. I, just to echo that, I think, you know, what I would say is see this as a huge opportunity, um, you know, to, to, to make a career, to, to build a profile, to, to drive change in, in your organizations. I think this is a massive change, uh, and transformation project and, um, you know, has so many good things to offer from, from competitive differentiation um, to to driving ethical practice and, and rebuilding that, that trust that we've lost in this in this ecosystem. So, you know, seize the opportunity. Thank you, Jason. Mary, you have the last word. Um, uh, my final thoughts are, are thank you to you, Lourdes, and, and to my other panelists for, for helping to push privacy tech forward. And um, obviously everyone who's attending this conference today really cares about it. And I think together we can um, help to enhance the category. So thank you so much.